Matthew Mitchell. He is a senior research fellow at the Mercatus Center, and his primary areas of research include economic freedom and economic growth, government spending, state and local fiscal policy, public choice, and institutional economics. Dr. Mitchell received his PhD and his MA in economics from George Mason University. He received his BA in political science and BS in economics from Arizona State University. Dr. Mitchell currently serves on the Joint Advisory Board of Econ Economists for the Commonwealth of Virginia, where his input helps the state formulate its revenue expectations. He's testified before the U.S. Congress, and his work has been featured in numerous national media outlets, including the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, the Washington Post, the Washington Times, National Public Radio, and C-SPAN. So without further ado, Dr. Mitchell. Good to be in Pennsylvania. My, my favorite Pennsylvanian, uh, of course, is Don, and my second favorite is Nate. But my third favorite is um, Benjamin Franklin. And Franklin, of course, said, moderation in everything, including moderation. Uh, so Keith Hall may be uh, moderation in optimism. And I'll, I'll continue that theme a little bit, but at the end of the talk, I want to get uh, to actually some positive points, because there, there, there is some, it, it doesn't look, there are a lot of things that don't look great right now, but it, it, we're not flying blind. Uh, and this is particularly true at state levels, where we have 50 states and good data going back on many, many things from 40, 50 years sometimes. And um, because of that, we, uh, we can say a bit about what works and what doesn't and the ways to um, address things like economic growth and state spending. So what I'm gonna talk about here is uh, primarily kind of bringing it to uh, the state level and state um, policy decisions. A little bit about the way that those affect an economy and then I'm gonna end with a discussion of how we can, what we can do to change the direction of state policy. Um, so First of all, just to give you a perspective of uh, what states have been doing over the long run, because I think that's, a, that's uh, we, it's easy to get caught up in what's, what's going on in the recession, but what's been the long run trend over um, several decades? So the blue line is uh, private GDP. This is the size of the, the private economy. So uh, one of the earlier questions, a great question, is what, how does government spending factor into uh, the economy? And, and the answer is that government purchases of goods, goods and services are counted. Um, but you might be interested in just what, how does the private economy does. So I, I subtracted that out, looked at the, at, at, just to look at private GDP. And this is adjusted for inflation as a multiple of, the, of 1950 values. So what you see with the blue line is that after 60 years of economic growth, the private economy is about five times the size that it was. So this is really good. This is like a household whose income has, has increased fivefold over a certain time period. The red line, however, is real state and local government expenditures. This is, your government, this is what government spends. And over that same time period, uh, these local, state and local governments, their spending has increased 13-fold. So this is like a household whose income has increased five-fold and whose consumption habits have increased 13-fold. So in a word, this is unsustainable. And I would argue it's an unsustainable for those people who favor um, a robust and active state and local government. If you like state and local, if you're a progressive and you like state and local government um, educating kids and housing and um, building infrastructure and doing all these things, this is actually pretty disturbing for you too. Because where does the red line come from? Where do we get all the resources that state and local government spend? Where do, where do we get that? We get it from the blue line. Everything that state and local governments spend comes from the private sector. It's either borrowed or taxed out of the private sector. And you cannot, over the long run, outpace your, you, you cannot outpace the growth of the private sector on which you depend. So that means if you're a progressive and you like government housing kids, or, or uh, building infrastructure or educating kids, you have a problem because that's gonna, rug's gonna be pulled out from under you pretty quickly. 
And there's a lot of there's a lot of stories about this happening. Actually, you can look at uh, Tennessee is a, is an interesting example. In the 1990s, a Republican governor expanded Medicaid eligibility up to a point where just about a third of all the population was on was eligible for Medicaid. Democrat came in, brought in McKinsey and Company. He'd been he'd heard that there was concerns about Medicaid growth in, in Tennessee. Brought in a uh, McKinsey and Company. They did an, an analysis and they said, Governor, you got a problem. If you don't change course quickly, you're going to bankrupt the state. You're going to have 90% of all your expenditures going into Medicaid. So overnight, 200,000 people were dropped from the Tennessee Medicaid rolls. Was that good for the people who were on Medicaid? To lure them into a system that was unsustainable, that wasn't going to be able to help them? Unsustainable promises benefit no one, least of all those who come to pretend, who depend upon them. Okay, so that's the way it looks over the long run. Uh, let's look at my our lifetime. So this, my, I was born in 1980. From 1980 to, to 1990, every dollar that the private sector added, state and local governments added three dollars. 1990s, it got a little better. Every dollar that the private sector added, the state and local governments added a dollar and ninety cents. But then in 2000, it really stepped up. And for every dollar that the state that the private sector added, state and local governments were adding almost four dollars. So not only is it unsustainable, but in recent years, it's getting even more unsustainable. We're, moving, we're galloping in the wrong direction, really. Now, this is about spending, but of course we're spending more than we're taxing, which means that we have debt. So what does this mean on an economy-wide level? Well, the best way to think about this is debt to GDP. Um, it's, the best it's, it's, it's our best understanding of how uh, debt affects the growth of an economy and how sustainable it is. So. Uh, you may have heard um, a relatively famous study by uh, economists Carmen Reinhart and Ken Rogoff. Uh, the reason this has gotten a lot of attention is because it is the most comprehensive study of public debt that anybody has ever assembled. They looked at 44 countries over a course of 200 years. They've done a series of studies on this. And they studied the, G the debt to GDP ratios of those countries and they looked at what, at what level does debt to GDP start to drag on, a, on an economy. And what they found is that gross debt to GDP, you're okay for a while, but once you get that 90% mark, then you start running into trouble. So once debt to GDP ratios hit 90%, you see a significant slowdown in economic growth. Now in the median case, your economy can slow by 1% um, GDP uh, per year, but in the average case, it, it's cut in half, 1.5. So let's, you, you might say, all right, well we can slow by 1 to 1.5, we could do that. What would that mean if we were to have uh, seen a that kind of a slowdown in our lifetime? So what this is, is um, GDP, real GDP, from 1970 to 2010. So this is the actual economy as it existed. Now, by the way, at what point do we reach 90% debt to GDP ratio? We're already there. Yeah, about 2010. Yeah, win, sorry. So, so we're already there. What would have happened if in 1975 we had accumulated the kind of debt to GDP ratio that we are in now? How would our economy have evolved over that time period? Well, this is the optimistic scenario. In the median case, I said you see 1% slower growth. Slightly more pessimistic scenario is you see half the actual growth rate. That's the, that's the average case. This is the way the economy would have evolved if, we'd, if in 1975 we had made the kind of decisions that we're making right now. So now, I want to draw your attention to one little spot. What's that little dip in that blue line up at the top? Where it goes down. That's all Keith's presentation. That's the Great Recession. The most calamitous economic event in any of our lives. Mass unemployment, mass underemployment, huge drop in per capita GDP, huge drop in living standards. And look, it pales in comparison to the consequences of, sl of slow and grinding growth due to too much debt to GDP. So this is, what we're this is what we're looking at going forward. Notice, by the way, half our living standards, half the growth, half the potential, half the income. It's a huge, huge effect. Uh, so I, I got in trouble with my wife. I made this presentation to my daughter and her friend. <laughs> it did not go over well. <laughs>
<laughs> um, but that's just national. States, too, are accumulating debt. People also often kind of forget this because states have a balanced budget requirement. Well, they have a balanced budget requirement in the operating budget. They're still allowed to borrow to build roads and build um, capital improvements, things that last. And on that, states are getting more are uh, getting more and more in debt. And then you have unfunded liabilities, which add to that. These are future promises to pensioners, mostly um, state pensioners, that are outstripping our our plans to spend. I'm sorry, our plans to, to tax. And so what that means is uh, we're going to get deeper and deeper in debt to GDP, G GDP ratios. So at what point do the states reach a 90% debt to GDP ratio? Well, we got curious about that. And uh, our colleague, uh, Jeff Myron, who's a Mercatus affiliated scholar, and he's a Harvard, Harvard economist, uh, uh, professor at Harvard, he looked at this and he calculated for each state, what's the, what's the year at which they reach a 90% debt to GDP ratio? So it starts off kind of innocuously. Uh, tw by 2025, there's only a handful of states that have reached that level. Uh, by 2030, it's considerably more. A uh, little drama, when, you, when does Pennsylvania reach it? It's uh, 2033 for Pennsylvania. So by 2040, most of the, state, most of the states are at a 90% uh, debt to GDP ratio. There's a couple holdouts, North Dakota and uh, Wyoming in 2050, and then by uh, 2070, every state in the union will have reached a 90% debt-to-GDP ratio. Does that spreadsheet describe the cost of debt? Including unfunded liabilities. Yeah, so what he did is he started with the real on-book debt, and then he started adding to tr th the other stuff to try to account for that. So on the one hand, he added um, unfunded liabilities and things like that, he also added, um, well, what about net of state assets? So states own a lot of property. They could sell the, this property in order to pay off their debts. So in some ways, he tried to be, you know, add as many negatives and as many positives as possible to try to be as comprehensive as possible. Good question. Um, so what does this mean over the future? Well, a couple of years ago, the federal government's Government Accountability Office, um, it's kind of like a uh, think tank that we all pay for through our tax, taxpayer dollars. Um, they're actually, uh, they do a lot of interesting studies. Um, they looked at uh, state, the, the, the future of state spending and these, hu these huge unfunded liabilities at the state levels and these huge accumulated debt levels. And they said, what, would, what kind of cuts and adjustments in state spending would need to happen in order for states to reach solvency and, and, to, and to close their fiscal gaps over the next 50 years. And what they said is states needed to, in, to cut spending by 12.3% now, this was 2010, immediately and maintain those cuts for each and every year for the next 50 years. Okay? So what have states actually done? Well, you may have heard, probably if you're reading the newspapers, in the recession, the states are slashing spending, they're gutting programs, cutting to the bone, right? So this is what Pennsylvania, uh, that's their general fund de decline from 2009 to 2010. One year decline of 9%. So you can look at this and you'd say, well, this isn't great. We're making about three-fourths of the cuts that we're supposed to be making, um, and we're not likely to sustain those cuts for each and every year for the next 50 years, um, and everybody's characterizing this as deep slashing cutting that's cutting to the bone, right? So you might look at this and say, that's not great, but at least we are cutting, right? Pennsylvania is at least adjusting. Well, the problem is that 9% figure that you read in the press is only the general fund. And the general fund is actually not, it's increasingly for most states, it's not even a majority of what state spending. So let's put that in perspective to, to account for total state spending. So there you can see the general fund over the, over the course of the recession, it actually went up. Um, so you might say, okay, we're, we're kind of getting there, but again, that's only one part of the state budget. So I'm going to adjust this figure. I'm going to have to, I'm going to bring in the rest of state spending, and in order to do this, I have to rescale it. So watch. That goes down. We make room for all the other spending, which is all other spending, borrowed funds, and federal funds, and we see that the state's moving in exactly the opposite direction. The federal government's GAO says that states should be cutting spending by 12.3% and maintaining those cuts for each and every year for the next 50 years. 
Pennsylvania is increasing spending 14% over the course of the recession. So we're moving in the wrong direction. And part of the reason we're moving in the wrong direction is that, the, is that states don't, state policymakers focus on the general funds in part because that's the, where, that's where the, they, they see the, the point of contact with their state taxpayers. For them, a lot of the federal funds basically seem like it's manna from heaven. It comes from, it doesn't come from their constituents, right? Unfortunately, it does, because 100% of federal taxpayers are also state taxpayers. But it's not such a, such a close connection, so it doesn't feel, it feels like free money even though it isn't. So part of this is not, part, part of what I want to emphasize is that I don't think state policymakers are in any way wrong or, or, or um, they, don't have, they don't have bad goals, but in many cases they have bad incentives. And particularly the incentives that the federal government provides to the state governments ensure that they don't have the right incentives to think prudently. Um, so how has Pennsylvania been adjusting spending over, the, over a little bit longer time period and what's driving the problem? So here we can look at uh, changes in spending over the different categories. You see overall spending, this is by the way real per capita. So this is adjusting for population and adjusting for inflation. So what the top figure, that 62% says, is that's how much, the state is spending 62% more per person in real terms than it did in 1987. So that's a pretty big difference. If you would think, if it were a normal, if it were a normal good, like an iPhone or a computer or anything, you would actually probably see a decrease in spending because uh, productivity allows, you, allows uh, goods and services to become cheaper over time, right? Instead, we're actually spending more per person. Um, but you see, by and large, it's not over throughout the whole budget. It's, it's Medicaid that really drives it. This looks like corrections is driving it, but in a second, I'm going to show you corrections is a really small sliver of the budget. So the 300 or the 258 percent increase in corrections is is a very very small figure. So I, don't let this fool you too much. The other thing I want to draw your attention to, by the way, is that cash assistance is actually down on a real per capita basis. Now. Talk to most economists and they'd say, what's the most efficient way to help the poor? They're going to say cash assistance, in part because we don't know what, uh, it get, when you give cash to somebody, you don't know what's the best way for them to spend the money. There's a, there's a lot of limits on what we can know um, is, is good for people. And if you give them cash, it opens up their choice set and they have more opportunities to decide where to send, where to send their money. And as Medicaid spending has increased radically, we're actually crowding out things like cash assistance, the most efficient means of helping the poor. So again, um, I don't think this is good news if you think that we should have a, a strong, healthy safety net. The, the, the bloat in the safety net for Medicaid is actually crowding out uh, the more efficient safety net in cash assistance. Okay, so now let's look at where these parts of the budgets are. And here's where you can see corrections is a rel relatively small part of the budget. Medicaid, however, where we have the hugest increase, is basically the largest part of the budget. So we're, it's a huge part of the budget, and it's the part that's uh, increasing the fastest. And that's why across the country, Medicaid spending has now doubled as a share of the budget over the last decade, or a couple decades. And uh, it's, it's outpaced by far every other uh, part of the state budget. Okay. So now I'm done with the moderation and optimism, done with the uh, pessimism part. Let's get to what are some solutions. So at George Mason University in 1986, James Buchanan won the Nobel Prize in economics. And one of the reasons he, he, he did this is pioneering the field of public choice economics. And this looks at the incentives that policymakers face. And a lot of his research um, points out that there's sort of two levels that politics takes place on. There's in period politics. Um, these are changes in the budget that happen on a day-to-day -day basis. Do we raise spending? Do we lower spending? Do we add a, add a uh, program? Do we cut a program? And then there's institutional changes. And these are changes that affect the incentives of everyday changes. These are things like, does Congress or does the legislature have the power to run a uh, deficit? How big can the deficit be? What kind of taxing power do they have? Are there does the governor have a veto power? What kind of veto power? These institutional changes, Buchanan pointed out, are very important for a couple reasons. One, they're harder to undo. So once you lock in something like a constitution, it's much more difficult to change it. 
two, they affect the in-period politics going forward for a long time. So I would point that these institutional changes are a much more interesting and lucrative way to think about, or fruitful way to think about changing the incentives of policymakers. Because you can cut a budget this year, but the next year's legislature can always add it. But if you change the power of politicians, if you change the incentives that they face and the, and the powers that they hold, then you can have a lasting impact on the future. So I would point towards institutional changes. You alter the incentives of politicians, bureaucrats, voters, so that you can make lasting change. So what kind of institutional changes would I be looking for? Well, here again, it gets back to what we know from looking at 50 states over the course of 30 or 40 years, is uh, we see a lot of different experiments. Uh, Justice Brandeis famously ex uh, described the states as laboratories of democracy. Well, the results are in, and we actually know what some of these different institutional changes uh, mean. So I would point to three sort of broad categories of change we should be thinking about. One is, the first two are related to the, the way the federal government affects states. So states can't do it all on their own. Fewer controls, fewer federal dollars, and state level institutions. So I'll give you some examples of each of these. So fewer federal controls. Um, this is an estimate of the total federal unfunded mandates to the states from 2004 to 2008. It was 131 billion dollars. But this, of course, is before Obamacare, or the, I'm sorry, the Affordable Care Act. So this is the range of estimates for one program, the Affordable Care Act, the federal unfunded mandates, 60 to $118 billion in unfunded mandates. Sounds pretty affordable, right? Part of the reason it was made affordable, by the way, is because the states are made to pick up a, a, a large portion of the, of the uh, costs. So these federal controls and these federal, the, the, the federal mandates down to the states are affecting um, the amount that we spend. But they're also affecting the way that we spend. So an interesting case is, um, you may have read Arizona has recently stopped covering transplants in its, in its Medicaid program. Uh, and a lot of people, of course, are characterizing this as cutting to the bones, terrible, how could, how could you be um, limiting this important part of, part of the, the program? And I actually would say, gee, if you're gonna cover something, wouldn't you cover transplants? Well, an interesting part of the story that you may not have read is at the same time that Arizona decided to cut, ask the federal government for permission to cut back on transplants in, for Medicaid patients, they asked to, the federal government if they could cut back another program. And that's, there's a program that offers free taxi service for anybody who wants to go get a medical checkup. Not emergency, not, we're not talking about an ambulance, we're talking about a taxi service and they have public transportation. I used to live in Arizona. Uh, they have other means, of course, of sub subsidized means to get, to get to the doctor. They asked the federal government if they could cut that, and the federal government said no. So federal controls on state spending, it doesn't just mean that it encourages states to spend beyond their means, but in many ways, it encourages states to make what I would say are really not very rational trade-offs. If you're in a budget bind, the first thing you should be cutting is the least valuable program. I wouldn't think that the first thing to cut when you're talking about Medicaid would be transplants. I would say, let's get rid of the taxi service, right? So it offers perverse incentives as well uh, and changes the way states spend. So next, let's move to the federal dollars. So the way Medicaid works is it's called a matching formula. And every dollar that a state spends on Medicaid, it attracts up to $3 in federal matching funds. So think about the incentive that this offers. If you have a program that's only going to provide $1 million, if you're thinking about expanding your program and it's only going to provide $1 million worth of value to your state residents, but it costs $4 million, do you have an incentive to do it? You actually do, because your, your taxpayers aren't going to pick that up. You get to export three out of the $4 to the rest of the union. Now, there's a problem with that. <laughs> Every other state in the union has the same incentive. H.L. Mencken once described the state as that fiction by which we try to live at everyone else's expense. Well, this is, the Medicaid matching formula institutionalizes that fiction. It incentive, it, it's specifically designed to say, we want, you, we want to pretend that you can live at everybody else's expenses. So 
At the same time that Pennsylvania has its pockets in Virginia, in, in Virginia's, or its hand in Virginia's pocket trying to take money from them, Virginia, of course, has its hand in, in uh, Pennsylvania's pockets as well. So this doesn't work. Now you might say we should adjust, we should be thinking about adjusting the uh, Medicaid matching formula. Maybe we should make it so it's less generous so that it doesn't provide these perverse incentives to state policymakers. Well, the federal government did adjust it in the last couple of years. Unfortunately, they adjusted it in the wrong direction. Let's see. So they changed the federal matching formula so now it attracts up to $4.50. This was a temporary change, you'll be happy to know, but of course the temporary change was extended when the temporary part ran out. So we'll see how long this, this keeps, they keep uh, uh, doing this. So even when the federal government, even when there isn't a, a, a explicit formula, the interesting thing that you find out though is when the federal government sends money down to the states, it encourages states to spend more. So you may have remembered a couple years ago, uh, Governor Sanford, before he went on his camping trip, um, he decided to refuse some uh, parts of the stimulus money. And he did that because he said, wait, it looks like free money now, but when the money runs out, we, we're gonna, there's going to be constituency for this spending, and, it, and people are going to demand it, and so we're going to have to raise our own taxes when the federal money runs out. Well, he was absolutely right, actually. So uh, a couple, couple years ago, uh, some Mercatus-affiliated scholars did a study. They looked at... Um, decades worth of federal grants across all the states controlled for various other factors and they found sure enough, geez, even a temporary grant to the to the, from the feds to the state government results in an increase in, in future state taxes from 33 to 42 cents for every one dollar. So uh, money is not free. When you give money to the, fe from the when federal government gives money to the states, it creates a constituency for it and you end up, end up uh, increasing your own future taxes. Okay, now I'm gonna get to the last one. Both of those are federal changes, which may kind of make you think, geez, there's nothing we can do at the state level. And I do wanna emphasize, state problems, you need to be talking to the state, or to the federal government uh, and, and your federal legislators because they, have, they do have a responsibility over what's happening in the state. But there is something that the state can do by itself too. So uh, I've recently undertaken a, um, a survey of a, of a broad literature scores of studies of all kinds of state level institutions um, to see how different institutions affect state spending. So uh, how much time do we have? Two, two, okay, so I'll run through a few of these uh, and then I'll, I'll kind of leave it up and give you guys the opportunity to, if you want to ask, ask more about them. So uh, one, uh, the top is uh, all of these are in per capita spending and all of these are negatives, meaning I've, these are, I've identified all the things that, that have been shown in is separate spending and taxing committees. So some, there's different ways that states do this. Um, they will sometimes have one committee has jurisdiction over both spending and taxing, and in other states you have two committees have jurisdiction. Well the problem is when you have one committee you don't have, that's, that's in charge of both taxing the voters and spending on behalf of the voters, there's no incentive for decreasing spending. If you have it separate, the taxing committee becomes a very strong constituency for limiting spending because all they do is hand out pain. So they have a really strong incentive to limit the amount of pain that they hand out. Well, a, a study found that um, having t separate taxing and spending committees reduces uh, per capita um, state spending by about $1,200 per year. That's a big, big factor. That'll add up a lot over the, over the long run. Um, item reduction veto. So uh, we hear a lot about the uh, um, line item veto, and that's down there as well. We see uh, line item veto in a divided government can, can lower spending by about $100 per year per capita. But uh, item reduction veto, it gives the governor, a, it gives the governor a, an additional power. So in a regular line item veto, when the governor wants to get rid of an item, he, he zeroes it out. He has to zero it out. If he, has an, if he or she has an item reduction veto, he can lower the amount spent on that item. So what's interesting about this is that in a typical line item veto, it's basically give the, it allows the legislature to give the governor a take it or leave it offer. You don't like spending on this item? Fine, governor, go ahead, zero it out, I dare you to. But the line, item reduction veto allows the governor to say, wait a second, I don't wanna zero it out, but I don't think we should be spending as much as, as you want me to. 
And so it changes the balance uh, of power, and it actually has been shown to be a really significant impact on state spending. We're lowering per capita spending uh, by about $470. Um, one spending committee um, versus multiple spending committee. Um, that seems to make a, a, a big difference. Uh, if you have a lot of committees that have jurisdiction over spending, um, you have a, everybody's trying to reach into the pockets. But if you just have one, it actually uh, can be beneficial and it can lower spending by uh, about $200. Um, strict balanced budget requirements. These are just requirements that are made to make sure that, so every state but Vermont has a balanced budget requirement, but some are stricter than others. Some, are, some will allow you to uh, move a, a, a deficit over from one year to the next. Um, others say, well, it only needs to be balanced when it's passed. It doesn't actually have to be balanced when we count the money at the end of the year. Um, so there's different ways to, that, the, that um, you can have stricter weak balanced budget requirements. They're just designed to keep spending low, below revenue. But the interesting thing is that it lowers both. It turns out that, that making people tax for whatever they want to spend makes them spend less. By the way, I, this, is, this is why I, at, at the federal level, uh, I'm a big proponent of a balanced budget amendment because it turns out that when you're allowed to put, to, to put spending off on my daughter who is not eligible to vote, you have an incentive to spend a lot more. Living within your means forces you forces some accountability and, and really diminishes spending. But this is the impact of going from a weak to a strict balanced budget requirement. Imagine the impact of going from no balanced budget requirement to something at the federal level. It could be a big, big difference. Um, we can go through through others. Uh, the only one other ones I'd point out, just kind of interesting, is uh, sometimes you, fiscal conservatives talk about a biannual budget as being a good thing, but it actually it turns out that an annual budget cycle. Um, one year rather than two, that seems to lower spending. So I, I think that would uh, that actually is not a um, necessarily the, the best idea. Uh, I've done some work on tax and expenditure limitations. Um, those can work, but the details matter. The most common variety of tax and expenditure limitation only works, that, which is based on um, income of the residents or income growth of the residents. It only works in low-income states. A better tax and expenditure limitation looks at inflation plus population growth. It's much more binding, and it works in all kinds of states. Um, so there's a lot of options. There's a lot of uh, there's a lot of possibilities. The the future looks bleak in terms of the uh, trajectory of where we're going, but we're not flying blind. So we can learn from what the states are doing, and we can and we can apply those lessons both at the state level and at the federal level. Uh, and in my view, that is cause to be somewhat optimistic. And my, my wife asks me to make sure that uh, either she or, or our daughter is in every presentation. <laughs> Definitely. Yeah. Does Pennsylvania have, I think it has some of those. Yeah, it does. Which ones does it currently have? So uh, my colleague Emily has actually done a really nice job of looking at what Pennsylvania has. And it should be in your folder. have a rainy day fund, which is, it's not up here because it doesn't affect per capita spending, but it does affect other things like uh, volatility of your budget and makes things um, much, much smoother. Um, it does have a rainy day fund. It does uh, have centralized spending committees, so it's not every committee has its, uh, an ability to uh, have its hand in the pot. It does have an item reduction veto, so it's interesting. It's one of the few states that has those. Um, as well as, of course, a line item veto and an annual budget. But it does not have the, the strict sort of tax and expenditure limit that has been shown to limit spending. And I know that's something that Nate um, uh, can tell you a lot more about and has been working on, of course, in, in Pennsylvania. Uh, its balanced budget requirement is not of the strict variety. It's, a, it's one of those weaker ones that um, I can't remember the detail whether it allows the state to, to push off a budget deficit to the next year or what it is that makes it weak, but it's not a very effective one. Um, it does not ha require a supermajority for tax increases. Um, there's no, oh, the shutdown provision, that's kind of interesting, by the way. Um, so it turns out that states that, some states have an automatic shutdown provision if you can't come to a budget agreement. So the, if, you, if, they, if at the end of the, the fiscal year, the governor and the, and the legislature just can't agree, the state shuts down. 
Now, there's a lot of uh, limited government types who might think, oh, that's great, shut down, this, shut down the government. And of course, you see this at the federal level. There's a lot of reasons why the federal government might shut down if, if it's a debt, uh, if we run up against a debt limit or, or something like that. Um, but it turns out that states that have that provision where it shuts down, they actually spend more than other states. And I think it has something to do with that kind of take it or leave it offer, is that if it's a take it or leave it offer, offer that tends to benefit in, in the negotiating process, that tends to benefit whichever side is in favor of more spending. Because they basically say to the people who want to limit spending, I dare you to. Go ahead, do it. And I think you can kind of see this uh, in the 90s when the federal government shut down with the, uh, the failure of negotiations with um, President Clinton and, and Speaker Gingrich. Um, in the end, the public really mostly sided with the president on that one. And they said, boy, that's what those limited government types like. So uh, this is one where actually not, you, you really don't want the government to shut down if you're, if you're trying to negotiate for a position of more limited spending. Um, oh, I'm sorry. Okay, and then um, do, uh, yeah, they, don't, they have a separate sac uh, spending and tax committees. Interesting thing, by the way, and these are the, the final two, the Senate seats and the, and the ratio of House to Senate. Um, it turns out that the number of uh, legislators you have makes a difference. And if you have a lot of senators, you tend to uh, spend more. And if you have a high ratio of House to Senate members, you tend to spend more. Um, so that's not something that, that states change that often, but it's kind of an, but it gives you an idea of you know, another kind of institutional change that you can make that can make a difference. Uh, going back a couple of slides, uh, we had the pie um, chart, the yeah. breakout of the spending per, um, Uh, Thirty-one percent was listed as an all other, and I'm curious, first of all, what that thirty-one percent is, and which of the um, which of the categories do you have broken out there would accommodate for public pensions, and how much of an issue is that in Pennsylvania? Good question. Okay, so on the first one, I'm not sure. The reason they have the all other, so this is um, taken from the National Association of State Budget Officers, and the reason they have this all other is because. You know, every state is a little bit different, and it's, it doesn't all fall into that neat cat, into a neat category. So if we used state data, we might be able to get a little bit more specific answer to that, and maybe the folks at Commonwealth will be able to answer that question for you. So I'm not entirely sure. Um, it's just something that doesn't neatly go into one of those categories. Um, now, what about pensions? What I should have said when this came up is uh, employee costs run throughout the costs uh, in terms of pensions, um, that's a factor everywhere. So uh, that's why you know, a lot of folks who are interested in institutional reform and, and limiting government spending, they f hone in on Medicaid because it's the biggest and the fastest growing item, and they hone in on pensions. Because just about everywhere, pensions are a major driver of not necessarily spending right now, but spending over the next 40 or 50 years because it's on an uns unsustainable trajectory. And by the way, sometimes people, uh, the, the defenders of the status quo will sometimes cite how little states spend on, on pensions as a, as a plus. Like, oh, don't we, gosh, those people who are worried about state pensions, they're just worried about nothing. Look how little we spend. That's part of the problem. Pensions are underfunded. We've made these promises that are unsustainable and we're underfunding based on that. So we should either adjust the promises or we should actually fund them. But right now, we're luring all these state employees into the expectation that their pensions are gonna be there when they actually are not. And that, what that means is we could, we could tax 28 billion, is that what you said? Tax, we could put a, hundred, put, a, put a tax on that, put that money in the bank and let it accrue interest over the next um, several decades and it still wouldn't be enough. So, uh, I wanna get the grants, but talking about the shutdown provision, I agree. What I'd like to see, uh, and maybe you could spread this idea around some, instead of a shutdown provision, 
you know, we, we have our deadline of, uh, in, in June, our fiscal year, one minute past the deadline, the prior year's budget is frozen, then all, and all the legislature would be allowed to do then is they cannot increase overall spending. They could shift money around wherever they want. I think that would actually create a lot of pressure on the government trough feeding side. So, because they don't want to see a, you know, a leveling out of spending yeah. year after year after year. So, um, I, you know, I don't know if anybody else has any provisions like that. That's but getting back to grants, um, our organization up in Lehigh Valley, we, we actually have some county commissioners refused a federal highway safety grant. And the CDBG, Community Development Block Grant fight, was interesting. It was a great debate. Um, reluctantly, they had to vote for it because, you know, Meals on Wheels and, right. you know, all the, all the stuff. But the interesting thing we noticed was uh, we actually had the other side concede that the grant system is inefficient. Why are we funneling money up to the federal level so we get it back down? In fact, we're starting to coin the phrase, grant money isn't free money, it's the most expensive money you can ask for. Yeah. So I'm just curious if, if anybody's done a study on actual cost um, associated with grants, because the other thing, you know, in school districts, we're gonna start uh, boring down on specific numbers, but you know, everybody complains about the unfunded mandates, but it's my understanding the federal government can mandate nothing unless they bribe you with money first. That's right, that is right. right. Well, so, um, so that's the way a federal mandate works, is right. it's, it, 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 they actually don't say you must spend this or else. They say you must spend this or we'll just pull all your Medicaid funds. So are you aware of any studies that kind of compile, and I, that, that's the other argument we've been making, that you know, the grant money doesn't come from somewhere else. Right. A Lehigh County grant or a school district grant comes from taxpayers in that area. So a couple things on area. that. A couple yeah. things on that. First of all, by the way, on the, on the um, the mandates, unfunded mandates. That is the um, the silver lining around the Roberts decision is seven of the nine justices said at some point that looks more like coercion than it looks like a, uh, a deal. Uh, and so actually for the first time in a long time, um, there seems to be a little bit more of a limit to the federal government's ability to make those types of author, uh, offers to the states. Uh, President Reagan, unfortunately, was one of the ones who really advanced that idea. He, he withheld federal highway fund, matching funds to states that refused to uh, raise their drinking age to 21. So it's, it's, it's a bipartisan problem on that. Um, so on the, the studies of, of, of money being, federal grant money being free. So a couple of things, I guess, there's a different, couple of different ways you could probably a, 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 uh, attack it. One would be the way that um, our Mercatus colleagues, uh, Sobel and Crowley, looked at it, which is to say, how much do state, states' own taxes have to be increased? And you can do a really quick calculation. We've, you know, we've got the, uh, the figure here that, uh, you know, we've got the figure here that um, shows that every dollar sent to the states leads to um, 33 to 42, um, sense in future state tax, tax increases. So, you, so what I've been doing is anytime I see a federal grant project, I just do that calculation. So uh, in Oklahoma, the, the governor, uh, or um, I think it was um, Kansas, the governor re rejected some federal funds. And I did a story, wrote an op-ed about how um, he, he saved his future, uh, his, his uh, constituents you know, X billion dollars in state future state tax increases. So that's one way to do it. The other thing, of course, is that you can look at wh what position states are relative to the federal government in terms of how dollars that they send and get back. In the average state, it's gonna be zero. It's gonna be, it's, they're gonna break even. Some states, like I'm from New Mexico, we uh, always always benefit from, benefit from federal funding. Um, but the, um, you could look at that, I don't know where Pennsylvania is. And then the other thing, the, the final way is federal money isn't free. It's taxed or borrowed out of the private economy. And there actually are good studies of this. So what's the impact of taxing on an economy? And um, it's pretty consistent. I mean, there, there, nobody doubts, not even Paul Krugman doubts that there's a point beyond which taxation harms economic growth. Uh, long run studies are pretty clear about this. Some of the best stuff that I, I, that I, I'm a fan of are the, here's the, here's the relevant statistic, um, is uh, 
the economic freedom studies. So we have these studies that look at all kinds of factors that state spending, or uh, state and federal and, and national government spending, regulations, monetary policy, all these things. And these studies are very, very clear. The more um, intervention in an economy, the less economic freedom that the citizens enjoy, the less economic growth. This stuff does have a, have a cost over the long run. Even the, the Keynesian stuff, at best, it's a short run benefit. And it, even that, the data is all over the map. All over the map on how effective stimulus is. It's been greatly exaggerated in my view. Um, you know, the Nobel laureate, the last, uh, Th Thomas Sargent won the Nobel uh, Prize last year. And he's a macroeconomist and he's, um, he uh, gave, a, gave a quote in an interview, said, you know, the unfortunate thing is I think the president may have been told that there's a consensus among economists about this. He should not have been told that. That's just not true. That's right. And actually, Krugman will say that, too. Krugman will say, uh, we got to, you have to, uh, you, you only deficit spend in times of crisis, and then you run a surplus the rest. My biggest critique of Keynesian economics is that it um, doesn't have a realistic model for the way politicians behave. We have run a deficit, the federal government has run a deficit 90% of the time since Keynes made his pronouncement, since Keynes' general theory came out. We've been in growth periods 88% of that time. So by Keynesian logic, we should have run surpluses during most of that time period. Instead, we didn't. Um, who is it, uh, 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 the Cato scholar, uh, you know, I'll think of the name in a second. He's, he said giving money to um, government is like giving uh, keys and booze to teenagers. P. Joe work. there we go. Yeah, so you, once, you, once you offer, the, and what Keynesianism did is it offered an intellectual defense for deficit spending, and it totally changed the way politicians behaved after that. One of the things that Keynes argued was that the multiplier effect of, fed, of government spending was greater than one. Yeah. More recent studies have shown that that's absolutely not true, yeah. that the multiplier effect is less than one. So when government increases its spending and crowds out private sector and uh, reduces the actual GDP of the country. Yeah, that's right. So. Um, So the, it was asked earlier what part of government spending is counted in GDP, and it's government per, it's purchases. And because one dollar of purchases is automatically counted in GDP when they count GDP, then in order to understand how the multiplier, how stimulus affects an economy, you have to subtract it from one. A lot of studies don't do, or a lot of, I shouldn't say studies, a lot of newspaper articles don't do that. Um, so anytime you see a multiplier that is less than one, that means that government spending crowds out private GDP. Now maybe overall GDP might still increase if the multiplier is greater than zero, but it just means that all the new, new economic activity is government economic activity. If it's less than zero, then what that means is that the crowd out and, of the private sector is so great that it overcomes whatever increase you saw in, in, in uh, the public sector. And uh, this is, a, this is uh, some testimony in a correspondence. So here, less than a dollar, less than one, private sector is crowded out. Greater than one, private sector expands. Each dot represents a different, or each line represents a different setting and the range of estimates within that setting. Uh, and you can see over here, uh, Romer and uh, Bernstein, that's the administration's estimate. Way outside the band of what, of, of, of the need. So a couple things that you can notice. Uh, one is just a wide, wide range. Now, I happen to think stimulus is not effective, but it would be intellectually dishonest for me to say it definitely doesn't work. What irritates me is that the other side looks at the same data and says it definitely does work. 
there, I think there's a lack of intellectual honesty on that part. There's, they're just not acknowledging the degree, the degree of uh, disagreement. Second thing, the median study estimate here shows that the, the multiplier is less than uh, one. It's 0.77. So by the median, the, if you just if that's the way science were done by the average uh, person, which I don't, uh, a scientist, but I don't don't think we should necessarily say that's the way it's done. Uh, it, it, the estimate is that it crowds out private sector. And then the third thing I'd note is even the most strident Keynesian admits this isn't a long run get rich quick scheme. It's only short run. And it needs to be timely, targeted, and temporary for, for it to be effective. And I would argue on all three of those, it's very, very difficult for government to effectively carry it out. And we've got time for one more question if someone else would like to ask one. When I'm looking at this, and you're presenting it, and we're listening, and we agree, but it looks to me that a large percentage of the people who vote benefit from those federal dollars. Yeah. And I don't know how we convince people that they also will be better off if we can change this. You say to someone, oh, your taxes are gonna go up 11 for nine cents. So what, we're feeding kids. I mean, it, it strikes me that that's the difficulty we have. Yeah, I think that's I don't a, know if you have any ideas about that. I think that's a great point. Um, so that's why I have a couple of thoughts on that, and I agree, it's a, it's a complete uphill battle on that. We shouldn't pretend like that's, like it's, it's easy, because it is, it's very, very difficult. That's the essential problem with government spending, is that it concentrates benefits on, on constituents who are very vocal, and it, it diffuses the costs over the rest of us so that we don't notice it and we don't, and we don't know how to, res we, we don't have an incentive to resist it. So there's a, I have a couple of strategies on this, I don't know if it totally works, but one is, that's why I emphasize on sustainability. So you can tell a story about government, let's take uh, protectionism. This is something on which there isn't disagreement like this. Basically, 100% of economists agree that tariffs, quotas, that kind of stuff is bad. Paul Krugman is one of the most eloquent speakers on the bad effects of trade protectionism. And yet it's still very difficult to uh, eliminate tar tariffs and, and ba barriers to trade because they're concentrated on specific um, constituencies. So an economist can tell a story about how you, uh, you know, President Bush imposes 30% steel tariffs and that harms the economy more than it benefits the steel workers. He can talk, an economist can talk until they're blue in the face and it's still not gonna change that reality. But what I would emphasize is that it doesn't even benefit the people who receive the money if it's not sustainable. So a good story to tell here is Detroit. We spent decades with tariffs and subsidies and all kinds of special favors for American car manufacturers. And we can tell stories about how it raised the cost for consumers more than it raised the benefits for those, those producers, but a lot of people aren't gonna be um, convinced by that until you tell them the end result. The end result is thousands upon thousands of people, every generation were lured into that industry. 18 year olds for 40 years were told don't go study um, finance, marketing, healthcare, enge engineering, go um, get, go get a, a, a job in Detroit, putting tires on Cadillacs, building ca cars with terribly huge fenders. And you have, you lured these people into jobs that were ultimately not sustainable. And then when they go, when, when you find out it's not sustainable, now all these people lose their jobs and they don't have any human capital for what customers want. We did the same thing, by the way, with housing and, and uh, finance. For the 1990s and the 2000s, government policy systematically encouraged people to go into Arizona and Florida to build houses and New York to, to finance the building of houses. All those people suddenly lost their jobs they don't have skill sets for what customers actually want because it's very difficult for policymakers to accurately predict what the customers of tomorrow want. And now, of course, we're doing it the same, same thing in energy and, and green energy. We're saying, telling people to, encouraging people to go into those industries. So I would emphasize the sustainability. That, to me, has been one of the more convincing ways to, to, to make the case. There's probably other ways, but yeah. we have time. Okay, because you're not gonna win that argument, uh, just in the public domain. But when you get the other side to start saying, 
you know, you're right. This is a stupid, inefficient, expensive way to help people. I mean, I actually had one of the Democrat commissioners agree he'd rather keep all this money at the local level and then help people. And I'm saying that's a good step in the right direction. So I, I, you got to change the language, change how people perceive this stuff. Uh, don't make the philosophical argument. I mean, it's important, but, you know, well, it's not constitutional or it doesn't work. But if you get them to acknowledge it's inefficient and stupid, you'll, you'll start generating the potential to, to make some changes. So uh, I can't wait. Our goal next year is to get at least one school district in our region to reject federal, some federal funds. And you want to get rid of the Department of Education? That's how you start doing it. Yeah. So Mike, are we, not, are we about out of time or do we have time for more? I'll just speak from back here. We'll break now for 10 minutes and thank you, Dr. Mitchell. Thank you. So we'll uh, start our final speaker at 10 after 12, and um, after that is when we'll break for lunch. So please feel free to, if you're, if you're hungry, please feel free to grab some pastries as well.